G'day brothers and sisters, this is The Other Paul, and welcome finally to part one of a great series I've installed, really a series of series, if you will. So to briefly describe it, <clears throat> this series, The Ideal Historian, will be going through various sources, uh, primarily ancient, but I may also consider ancient sources as well as maybe one or two modern ones, particularly my favorite modern work of historiography by Gilbert Garrigan, Father Gilbert Garrigan. And we'll be looking at what has been said throughout history about the qualities of an ideal historian, um, seeing what these various authors said, chewing on the meat, spit out the bones, so to speak. And from that, trying to forge a picture of the, of the truly ideal historian, learning from many other great historical historians who have come before us. <clears throat> and because I want to make this more or less like a classroom, if you will, like the, like the lesson format as I, I've been used to, in teaching in actual classrooms, I want to, I want, I want to frame these as like lessons proper. So these things will be at least once a week, one on a history thing as per this series and one on a biblical slash theological topic on the relevant theme. And so the theme for the next long number of, I guess, history based videos will be on historical method. And the first set of those is going to be on the ideal historian as mentioned in various historical authors. And this first episode is going to be on a cert on sorry <clears throat> on a specific author known as Lucian of Samosata and his particular work How to Write History, which is in this volume of the Loeb Classical Library editions. And <clears throat> a cool thing about that work is that it's from it is from somewhere within the second century AD, so very early, and it is actually the only surviving work from antiquity dedicated to historiography, historical methods. So. It's really, really valuable in that respect. And I believe <clears throat> it will demonstrate that having read through the whole thing, I've thought, wow, this is actually a really good one-stop manual. And as I'll probably repeat towards the end of this, I actually do intend, should I ever be uh, teaching history in the future, likely at a university or college level, then I will almost certainly prescribe, let me move this camera a little bit. I'll almost certainly prescribe this specific text as like mandatory reading. You have to read this because it gives, it really gives a fantastic, well-rounded, overview of how you ought to do history uh, how history ought to be done as well as how a historian ought to be in his disposition which is what we're going to focus on not strictly speaking the composition of history itself that's what we'll be focusing on um good to see you here comes nobody i'd argue that polybius's rants also count historiography so they do they do there are there are plenty of comments you can find on historiography in ancient historians but they're typically nestled within works that are on something else. So with Polybius, for example, it's his, um, well, it depends on what edition you go with. My one, my edition of his work is called Rise of the Roman Empire, which covers from, oh, I want to say, I want to say from the first to the third Punic War. I'm not 100% sure if I remember correctly, but the Punic Wars are quite central to it. Uh, and he does make a lot of comments on historiography, particularly in, in just absolutely slamming the heck out of uh, out of another historian, Timaeus, of something. I forgot his name. But yeah, he doesn't make those comments, but Lucian's, Lucian's work is the only dedicated work of historical method that survives today, or historiography, generally speaking. And so it's very, 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 very valuable for us. And so uh, before we begin, and please, people, get the live chat happening. It's going to be great. I will be taking questions at the end as usual. And uh, because I want to make this like the classroom as much as I can, I'm going to open it up with a committal to prayer so as to have the Lord's favor, <laughs> if, if, if possible, in this lesson. So I shall pray for us. Lord, thank you very much for this lesson. I thank you for the great successes you've given me on this, this channel, which I consider a ministry for your glory. I pray you bring it up stride by stride. Keep it going. Keep it successful all for your glory, only insofar as it does bring you glory. And I pray, Lord, in particular, that this first lesson of many to come, Lord, on many countless topics would be successful, that people would learn from it, take away from it, and so be able to enrich their lives and enrich their own study with it, Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen. Yes, I'm a Protestant. Yes, I do the sign of the cross at me, cuz. <laughs> so let's begin. Here's my fancy slides right here. And oh, yes, let me put up the banner as a quick plug to begin i need to do i need to do what christian wagner does if you're watching cuz where he has that little pre-recorded ad at the beginning um it's a bit long so i'll probably make mine a bit shorter and more pithy but it's actually pretty good so i should probably do that so you're not subscribed remember to destroy that subscribe button and absolutely annihilate the like button and its entire family please go ahead and do that if you haven't already 
And likewise, if you <clears throat> wish to support my work, you believe in what I'm doing, please, by all means, become a patron, buy my merch and or direct uh, donate to me directly via paypal.me. So let us commence with part one of <clears throat> the ideal historian and do share this to other people who you think may be interested in this, especially if they can watch right now. So the ideal historian part one, focusing on Lucian of Samosata. So to begin with, we'll give a very, very brief biography of Lucian because not entirely pertinent to today, but he lived circa 1A, uh, 120 AD 120, Anno Domini 120, uh, to, to sometime after 180. And as briefly described by Encyclopedia Britannica, he is a rhetorician, pamphleteer, and a satirist. Emphasis on satirist, that really seems to be his greatest claim to fame, <clears throat> as that was what he did in his later life and where he wrote the bulk of his stuff. So he was a Syrian native educated in Greek language and literature from a young age, and he became a traveling rhetorician or public speaker when he, when he then eventually settled in Athens and focused on writing critiques, particularly satires, of contemporary intellectual life. And in this case, how to be history, as well as being a positive case for how to actually write history, that's more actually the second half of the work. The first half is dedicated to just ridiculing uh, the sloppy historians, both from the time of Lucian and from before his time, particularly, for example, Aristobulus, who was a biographer of Alexander the Great. Or, well, he wrote he, he wrote some kind of history of Alexander the Great, but his personal, his actual personal biographer was Callisthenes of Miletus. Uh, but yes, he mocks the dirty practices of many historians from his time and before as examples not to emulate, as well as provide an example or two of historians to emulate, particularly above all others, Thucydides. He considers Thucydides a top, but we'll get to that. He also, another reason why maybe Christians who are into history may know of him is because he also mocked Christians in, in a dedicated work called The Passing of Peregrinus, which is actually one of the earliest pagan works on Christianity. So it is actually a very, uh, it is a somewhat valuable source on understanding, on understanding the nature of Christians and of Christianity and their beliefs in the early second century, but, <clears throat> or likely, actually likely mid to late second century given his lifespan, but it's 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 kind of difficult because it is a satire, a lot of fiction mixed in there, so it can be a bit it can be a bit, um, shall we say, difficult to try and parse the truth from fiction. <clears throat> but apart from that, that's what there exists, and I have that little bracket at the bottom there because uh, that was just going to be a placeholder for for more stuff, but I put the more stuff already in, and I forgot to take it out. So whoopsie daisies. Oh well. Now that's that's pretty much all we need to know. And again, as usual, please comments, questions. We'll be taking questions at the end as well. Now, part two, a synopsis of how to write history. How to write history. So as I said, the first half is dedicated to critiquing past and contemporary for his time historians for various faults, particularly, but not limited to flattery of rulers and even straight up inventing fiction. One historian, he says, actually made up the future <laughs> in his history. So the stuff that hadn't even happened yet, which is absolutely hilarious. And he also critiques laziness and research, too much dedicated, too much space dedicated to minor details or too little space dedicated to major events, bland presentation among a bunch of other faults. And he outlines principles on how history ought to be pursued and written, citing contemporary and past examples, uh, historians as examples to be avoided or mimicked. And for the latter, as I said, Thucydides is above them all. He believes Thucydides is a true template for a good historian in his Peloponnesian War, for those who don't know. And he provides detailed comments on the proper disposition of an historian, which we can learn a lot from and which is going to be the focus of today. And far out, what is with my throat? I need this tea. Oh, man. So part three, the bulk or the pretty much almost entire, the entire presentation here is the historian of how to write history. So some preliminary stuff, all my citations and quotes are from the Loeb edition. So Lucian volume six from the Loeb classical library. If anyone wants to pick it up, it's very, very good. And uh, the chapters uh, note as well, that chapters, when I give chapter citations, the chapters are only given on the Greek side of the Loeb edition because Loeb is bilingual, has Greek on one side, English on the other. And for some reason, there aren't chapters on the English side 
of the of the of the text, but there are on the Greek side. So I simply look at because I can read somewhat Greek, ancient Greek. I just simply look at the Greek side and see the equivalent chapter number of the English part that I'm citing, and that's what where I get the chapter number. But yes, the primary section we're going to be looking at is the second half of the book, starting from chapter thirty-three, where he begins his positive case, having ridiculed many other historians. And chapter 41 in particular is a very, very, very core summary that we want to pay a lot of attention to. And you can stuff right off bot. Thank you. Then chapter 33 to the end of the book describes how a historian ought to behave and how history ought to be written. And I want to put a little bit of a distinction between those two things. There's the, there's the nature of the historian himself versus how the work of history ought to be written, how it ought to be done. I want to put a bit of a distinction in that. I'm not pursuing the how to write the history per se, but what the historian ought to be, how he ought to behave, how he ought to be in his disposition. That's the focus of this series. And eventually we'll cover like actual history making and in which case we'll almost certainly revisit Lucian because again, he has a lot of wisdom here. So let's commence. The first passage and really the first, really the first principle, if you will, because I want to organize, organize this by principles as well is, uh, whoopsie daisy, sorry, just refreshing something quickly, is a historian's qualities or an historian's qualities and technique, as it call it, or in the Greek, techne. Now, first quote from chapter 34, he says, I maintain then that the best writer of history comes ready equipped with these two supreme qualities, political understanding and power of expression. The former is an unteachable gift of nature, while power of expression may come through a deal of practice, continual toil, and imitation of the ancients. These then need no guiding rules, and I have no need to advise on them. So the first, the, these are these are these are already really interesting off the bat, because often you may see with historians, with modern historians today, they may not per se be great in their power of expression, so to speak. We're going to have a lot more to mention on this later, but often contemporary history, at least the best history you get today, stuff that's like academic to you that really does delve into the primary sources as it, and isn't just a just a pop work you can get for a couple of bucks at the store or, or one that is more expensive but isn't a good history work. Often they, they kind of actually enforce that as a norm to have bland academic language, so to speak. And I hate it. I really hate it. And that's why I really sympathize with Lucian here, who actually says that there is such a place for power of expression. And he talks about this in more detail later on in the work, and we will look at that. But yes, with what's interesting is that this is something that can be learned, but the former political understanding is something that's really only something by nature, which is very, very interesting. As, as far as I interpret with him when he says this, it's, it's, it's simply referring to how someone may have this intuitive understanding of how humans behave, how humans interact, particularly, of course, in this political context. And so it's not really something that can be taught. It's something, at least according to him, he's simply, he simply has it as his disposition of nature. So if you don't have that disposition already, according to Lucian, bad luck, not good. And I half agree with him here, half disagree with him that yes, there is a real natural intuition that people can have like with understanding how people, how humans behave, how politics as an as extension, how politics happens, how people interact in that respect. But I do believe it can be, I do believe it can be learned as well, but definitely not in the same normative way as you might learn rhetoric, for example, or learn about a topic in history, for example. It's really something that you've got to infuse into your nature by practice, by constant exposure and experience. So, and, and maybe, maybe Lucian, maybe Lucian does agree with that. Maybe by unteachable, he simply just means you can't just be told this is what you do. This is what you see. Um, but maybe he would grant that this is something that can be acquired naturally over time. And to that, I would largely agree. And I would thus encourage people who want to be historians to Get a feel for human nature, <laughs> become a social person, get an understanding for politics. It's very important stuff because history, unfortunately, unlike today, it's not merely about recording events, but making sense of things, really putting things together, which is largely speaking politics. Now, in his second quote, 
You would not say that the intelligent man has no need of technique and instruction where he is ignorant. Otherwise, he would play the liar, blow the pipe, and understand everything without learning. As it is, he could not do any of this without first learning. And with someone to guide him, he will learn most easily and perform them well for himself. So it's one thing to have a natural aptitude in something already. That's good. These are necessary prerequisites. It's another thing to actually have the skill. He actually does say that th that history is a matter of technique, as I said in the Greek, techne, or a craft or an art, something that is acquired. That's what tech a techne is. It's not something you have naturally. It's something you must acquire, something you must learn. And so that's what he says with history. It's something. It's not something you can just wake up one day and start doing. You've got to actually learn it. You've got to actually really, really learn it, and how to do it, how to do the method, how to, how to go about the process. And that's why this series exists and future series on historical method will exist. Next, real experience. And this is where I see a lot of divergence from modern history, from modern historiography. So give us now a student of this kind, not without ability to understand and express himself, keen-sighted, one who could handle himself, handle affairs if they were turned over to him, a man with the mind of a soldier combined with that of a good citizen, and a knowledge of generalship. Yes, the one who has at some time been in a camp and has seen soldiers exercising or drilling and knows of arms and engines. Again, let him know that know what in column and what in line mean, how the companies of infantry, how the cavalry all maneuvered, uh, are maneuvered, sorry, the origin and meaning of lead out and lead around. In short, not a stay at home or one who must rely on what people tell him. Now, I must take another sip. I'm sorry, what's with my throat? <clears throat> for ancient history, we can't really do this. We, we, we simply can't. And that's my main area of work. We more or less have to rely entirely on what people tell us, or if we're lucky, what archaeological remains tell us. So for ancient history, this isn't the most relevant, but there is still relevance because there are ancient places. There are archaeological remains. There are cities. There are actual actual artifacts from the period that we can get in which respect this principle can and really should be applied. A good example I know of <clears throat> is on, if anyone, if anyone's familiar with like the online apologetics world towards Islam, there's a channel, a Christian apologetic channel called Fanda Films, P.F. Anda, Fanda Films. And he looks a lot at the work of a if you will, amateur archaeologist, but really not amateur in the in the negative sense, it's called Dan Gibson, who personally went to hundreds of mosques, at least over, I think, oh no, probably like many, like many, 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 all the oldest of mosques in the in the general Arabian Central Asian world and North Africa, all the oldest mosques, and personally triangulated with a really cool satellite technology where they were pointing because the norm for Islam today and for a long time has been that, uh, the Kaaba, uh, no, not the Kaaba, the, ah, uh, I forgot what it's called. Basically the, the mosque, when you're praying at a mosque, there's a certain part of the mosque you pray at, and it points towards Mecca. Now he went to all of the oldest of these, of these, um, ah, I still can't, I still forget what they're called. All the oldest of these mosques. And they actually all pointed towards Petra. Really, really interesting. Basically, it's part of a wider argument that actually Petra was the original Mecca and Mecca was only a later thing. He found all the very oldest mosques pointed towards Petra. Some later ones pointed in between Petra and modern day Mecca. And then after that, they all start to point towards Mecca proper. He actually went on the ground to these places, did the measurements himself and came to that conclusion versus a mainstream historian of Islam who had only visited like maybe one or two of these and gotten his data otherwise secondhand and and his name is david king and that that wouldn't be it's it's a fault because it shows that he and yet he was doing work on these on these on these mosques where they pointed among other features and yet that wouldn't be it, it, that's that's an issue because it shows that he didn't actually go out into the real places to actually get this data himself so that's why that's why lucian's principle here is so darn important because we can see this example of going out into the real world, getting you the real data versus not doing that and you don't have the real data. But what made it worse is that this David King guy went on an absolute tirade against Dan Gibson, like just totally trying to trash his work. And yet he couldn't discredit it at all because Dan Gibson's data was solid. And so that's a that's 
that's really a um dan dan gibson is it i think it's dan yeah i think it's dan gibson i think his name just look up fan films find a guy called dan about talking about mosques and they're pointing towards petra as well as their responses to david king and you'll see this issue it's actually really really fascinating from a historical standpoint so that is an example of how we can in ancient history get real experience but with Lucian here, in his perspective, he's talking about contemporary history because he does also talk about contemporary events in which historians are bungling things up. They're not actually going to the places. They're not actually knowing what's happening. So in contemporary history, we could see, let's say, for example, if someone wants to write a history on one of the various wars within our lifetime, let's say the Iraq war, the war in Afghanistan, or perhaps even Ukraine right now. And yet, <clears throat> sorry. And yet they have no idea about the nature of the politics of these places, about how militaries function, about the various facets of the of the institutions, of the organizations involved, and yet they just write a history on it. At best, they're going to be able to get data on what happens, if even that, and that's it. But that's not going to be a good history. They're not going to be able to tie things together. They're not going to be able to explain the details of the issue because they don't have actual experience in what's happening. It doesn't mean you actually have to be in the war itself, but for example, if you want to write a, a good history on a modern war, you being an actual soldier on base, even if in a different war or in a, in a different area, you would, you would still give you some good real world knowledge and experience on what it's like to be a soldier in an army, on an army base, your daily routines, things like that. Stuff that will really help you contextualize what's happening in these historical events of a war and so that's why historical or real experience to whatever capacity you can actually get is extremely extremely important in history according to lucian and i 100 agree with him though again with the qualifier that this is not as doable for ancient history and he'd probably agree because alexander the great for him was already 400 years prior and that was from chapter 37 now we have objectivity, and this is something he really stresses the most. These, these quotes, I'm giving big block quotes here, but he says a lot more in the book. And again, please do pick it up if you're a student of history. Highly recommended reading, fantastic stuff. And yet I thought to keep in a good chunk of his comments on objectivity because he really stresses this. So chapters 39 to 40, he says this, the historian's sole task is to tell the tale as it happened. This he cannot do as long as he is afraid of Artaxerxes, one of the rulers of Persia when he is his physician or hopes to get a purple kufta. And that is a, I'm trying to remember correctly, it said in the footnotes, it's a kind of, it's a kind of robe, if I'm not mistaken. Let's, oh, whatever. It's, it's, it's a fancy kind of clothing. A gold necklet or a Nis, uh, Nisaean horse as a reward for the eulogies in his work. And eulogies, by the way, are eulogies or funeral speeches are very big in ancient historical works. And Lucian makes a big point about composing good eulogies, which I think gives a good, interesting discussion on the nature of like truth in, in, in like actual precise details. Cause it almost implies that eulogies, that it was a norm for eulogies to be, oh, I guess he's talking about the historian's own eulogy themselves, but yes, there's a, there's a big, there's a big emphasis on eulogies in ancient history, which is very, very interesting and points to how it's all tied up to a single to a single purpose to it's it's all one long thread versus modern histories which can to be bland academic diatribes but yes no xenophon a just historian no thucydides thucydides will do that on the contrary even if he personally hates certain people he will think the public interest far more binding and regard truth as worth more than enmity and if he has a friend he will nevertheless not spare him if he errs this, I have said, is the one thing peculiar to history and only to truth must sacrifice be made. When a man is going to write history, everything else he must ignore. In short, the one standard, the one yardstick is to keep in view not your present audience, but those who will meet your work hereafter. Whoever serves the present will rightly be counted a flatterer, a person on whom history long ago, right from the beginning, has turned its back as much as his physical culture on the art of makeup. Objectivity. He stresses this a lot. And there's another big quote or maybe one or two other big quotes after this where he stresses this even further. You've simply got to be objective. You're not trying to flatter someone nor trying to hate someone to, to, to really slander someone whom you really hate. The object of history in Greek, historia, inquiry, is 
simply telling the tale as it happens in the word of Lucian. No excuse. You are not allowed in proper history to unduly flatter people, nor to unduly slander them. You have to give the facts as they are. Now, I think, actually, I think I might leave this to the discussion at the end. I'm just trying to give Lucian's views here. I'll give my own takes. And perhaps you guys as well, if you're in the chat, can give your own takes as well. Please do, by all means, get in that chat, get discussion happening, send in questions as well whenever they come up. <clears throat> Particularly for any patrons who may be watching, send a question whether in this chat or in the patron questions chat, and you will be a priority. So yes, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. If you're a flatterer, if you're working only for the present, you're going to be swept up. You're going to be deemed irrelevant with time. And this points to another principle that will be coming on soon with Lucian, we'll be getting to later, is longevity. There is such a thing with history that you are looking towards the future. You are making this for the benefit of your posterity, in Lucian's own words, not for the present. That's key. That is really, really key here. And we will get on to that. Now, this, in my opinion, is the core, the really the, the, the core, most emphasized statement on the nature of a his, of a of an ideal historian in Lucian. I think he really, really stresses it hard here. You can see it, his language in this area is particularly um, colorful, not in a negative sense, but in in a, in a in a in a sense of passion. It's particularly strong here. That then is the sort of man the historian should be: fearless, incorruptible, free, a friend of free expression and the truth. Intent, as the comic poet says, on calling a fig a fig and a trowel a trowel, or a spade a spade, as we would say. Giving nothing to hatred or to friendship, sparing no one, showing neither pity nor shame nor obsequiousness. Big word, I know. An impartial judge, well disposed to all men up to the point of not giving one side more than its due. In his books, a stranger and a man without country, independent, subject to no sovereign, not reckoning what this or that man will think, but stating the facts. Oh, my throat is not loving me today. <clears throat> very strong. Very, very strong here. And I can see kind of where, you can kind of see with Lucian as you read him, where the modern attitude for history has come, particularly like post-enlightenment, where it really is focused on objectivity, not taking sides and all that, which unfortunately has gone awry to the point where people get a false neutrality, pretending that they're truly neutral when really they're, there is no such thing, but you can at least strive to be objective. And in this, Lucian is totally spot on. Um, his his emphasis on being on just being a total stranger. You're not even subject to a to a sovereign. Particularly strong in regards to how objective you must be. You must even regard yourself as simply an alien, uh, a member of no country. When you're writing a history, you're simply stating things as they happen. You must be willing to offend your friends and to compliment your enemies because that's what the nature of the facts are. And unfortunately, it's an eternal lesson that can never not be repeated enough because time and time and time and time again, we get people coming into the historical plane, coming into the into the field of historiography and just spewing absolute crap not warranted by the facts. And we see this now, unfortunately, with the rise of critical theories, critical race theory in particular in the field of history. Sadly, very, very sadly, where they will straight up boast about having preference for the so-called oppressed class in their telling of the nature of their oppression and by default discounting the testimony of those in the quote-unquote oppressor class because they happen to meet a certain bad criteria that has absolutely no bearing on their testimony, which is very, it's very unfortunate. This lesson cannot be repeated enough, and yet it must, unfortunately. And to that, we'll have more to discuss at the end, I guess. Presentation. Now, this is the one I mentioned at the beginning that for some reason, modern historians, even otherwise good historians, just often don't really care about a lot, which sucks, particularly in academic context, because academia has this, and I hate it so much, this absolute dichotomy between academic and, shall we say, appealing language. If you're going to give academic language, then, then you must just be totally, totally, totally bland. Um, now, this is interesting. Here comes nobody. Then why are early Christian sources dismissed so easily <laughs> with respect to oppressor, oppressed class? Good question. Um, I guess they, I guess the critical race theorists, historians, if you can even call them that, don't really work into that field a whole ton. But because many of them, unfortunately, are Christians, many so-called CRT scholars are actually 
Christians. You can see them in many places, sadly. And so they would say, they probably would be consistent in this respect and say, yeah, the Christians are the oppressed. Let's listen to their voices, all that jazz. But then your atheist ones, I'd love to see the pretzels they go through to, to not justify the uh, the Christian experience, the oppressed Christian experience from the early empire. That'd be, that'd be very fun to see. But yes, so he says on presentation, for just as we set free expression and truthfulness as the target for the historian's mind, so for his language, this should be the first aim, to set forth the matter exactly and to expound it as lucidly as possible, using neither unknown nor out-of-the-way words, nor that vulgar language of the marketplace, but such as ordinary folk may understand and the educated commend. Then let figures adorn the work that let figures adorn the work that give no offense and in particular appear unlabored. Otherwise, he makes language seem like highly seasoned sources, that is, redundant. Let his mind have a touch and share of poetry, since that too is lofty and sublime, especially when he has to do with battle arrays, with land and sea fights, for then he will have no need of he will have need of a wind of poetry to fill his sails and help carry his ship along high on the crest of the waves. Let his diction nevertheless keep its feet on the ground, rising with the beauty of his subjects and as far as possible resembling them, but without becoming more familiar or carried away than the occasion warrants. So in other words, achieving a perfect balance of simply stating things as they are, not adding untrue details, and yet also being colorful and appealing with your language. And as I said, how many good academic historians really keep to this in respect to at least trying to keep to the facts as they are? Pretty much universal. Key emphasis on trying. Whether they actually do is another question. But in regards to trying to make good language that the ordinary folk can understand, yeah, that's, 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 that's fairly common until you get to the really esoteric stuff. But when it comes to actually putting in like a, a little touch of poetry and, and good and good prose stuff that really invokes the imagination, not going beyond what's truthful, but still making it a fun and exciting read. Yeah, no, nah, this is, this is pretty, yeah, no, nah, it's not good. <laughs> Modern modern academic historiography fails quite spectacularly on this part. There's exceptions, of course. There is there is there is good works out there that really do give a good picture. I think one example would be um, Bullies and Saints by John Dixon, which I don't fully agree with his framing on certain issues, but he is an actual historian. Um, he actually does appeal to ancient sources, so it's a, it's a, as far as I've seen a good work of history, generally speaking, even if it's only a, a brief touch on the subject matters. But his writing is good. It's not super, super colorful. Probably could be more, but his writing is good. He actually he actually does a good job at conveying things and expressing himself in language and all that stuff. It's It, it really does work. Ewan, good to see you here, mate. Joining us very late, so we'll have to catch up. Not sure if you addressed this already, but from the last two points, objectivity and presentation, there seems to be a lot of cross between the ideal historian and the ideal preacher. Have a good stream, all. Likewise to you, whatever you're doing this. Uh, oh, now that you're here, mate. Good to see you here. E yes, somewhat, I guess so. So the, yeah, yeah, there would be. I'd say really for the preacher, the principles of objectivity and presentation are are basically identical. For the preacher, you're, you should not be going beyond what Holy Scripture, what good theology says, but then you should also spice it up with good, uh, um, good, how would I say it? Good articulation with colorful language, again, not beyond what is actually true. So yeah, in that respect, the ideal historian and the ideal preacher are pretty much the same. At what point does esoteric history turn into lore? I'm not precisely sure what you're referring to here. Esoteric history. So like, do you mean that in like the the kind of like common pejorative sense of esoteric history where like it's it goes to like the point of purple prose and overly flowery poetry? Or do you mean like, esoteric in like the in the real technical mystical sense um not not sure exactly what you're referring to here um so one second uh da, 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 da. oh i think i might yeah yeah so so law being i think i think i might get what you're saying so law being like stuff that's passed on by tradition by common people through the generations and all that like as in when does it turn into nonsense it, <clears throat> you can't exactly point to objective markers per se but you can kind of just tell when it happens. You got to compare the the evidence and the facts of the matter 
with the work itself. So that's really the only way you can figure out when it turns from history into just straight up BS. You compare the two things as they are. So yeah, it, it, it really depends on a case by case basis. You've got to actually have a case study to determine. And so we can think of when it happens. You can only think of it in terms of general principles. Like, look, if there's, if the correlation between the historical presentation and the facts has a disjunct, then yeah, it's turning into, it's turning into nonsense now. So yeah, that's really, that's, that's, it's, it's really a case by case thing. You gotta, you gotta, you, you know it when you see it, if that makes sense. Now, so presentation, extremely important and unfortunately highly neglected, which is why in my own, once I do get into proper histor historical, historical, historiographic writing in the future, I want to, I want to embody it all. I want to have it both really well academically and yet also with really good presentation. That's what I hear a lot of people say about, so, okay, he is a historian, but he mostly does like biblical theology stuff with Dale Allison, for example, he is very thorough academically, tons of sources, tons of footnotes. And yet he's a really good writer as well. He, he has very appealing language. That's what I hear a lot of it. I've, I've read a little bit of his stuff and I can see it and he actually does it well. So you know, there you go. An eye for the future. So reading chapter 42, Thucydides laid down this law very well. See here, he's appealing to Thucydides. He does this quite frequently. He's the ideal historian, according to Lucian. Thucydides laid down this law very well. He distinguished virtue and vice in historical writing when he saw Herodotus greatly admired to the point where his books were named after the muses. For Thucydides says that he is writing a possession for evermore rather than a prize essay for the occasion that he does not welcome fiction, but is leaving to posterity the true account of what happened. He brings in too the question of usefulness and what is surely the purpose of sound history, that if ever men find themselves in a like situation, they may be able, he says, from a consideration of the records of the past to handle rightly what now confronts them. And so Lucian here portrays to us what he believes the very function of history itself is. In order to get a true account of the facts of a situation, so that if a like situation ever does pop up again in the future, people can look back to the past and say, hey, what do these guys do here to get around it? And thus learn from it. So history <clears throat> for Lucian and for really, and, and really for just ancient historians in general, as I've read, it's it's never, unlike for many people today, it's never just been an exercise in in just pure intellectual stimulation of pure interest and all. There's, there's, a, there's a utility to history. There's a reason why it's being written. <clears throat> I will say myself, history for me is largely intellectual stimulation. I'm genuinely just fascinated by it, but I am also considering how, where its utility comes in, particularly Christian history, the utility of it being Christians for Christians to understand their roots, where our origins are, as well as for apologetic purposes when the historical veracity of our faith is assaulted. Although I'm not much of an apologist right now, but just for my own benefit and for those others around me, I like to know history so that if the questions do get sent our way, I can give a good rebuffing. And that's just for Christian history. <clears throat> Nonetheless, Lucian gives this utility of history. There is a purpose to it. It is for the future. It is for the use of those who may find themselves in another situation. There is a true utility to history. And likewise, in chapter 61, towards the end of the work, in general, please remember this, because he, he has an interlocutor that he's speaking to in, uh, well, not an interlocutor, but uh, he, has a, a, he has another person that he's actually addressing in this work so as to be sending them, uh, so as to be giving that person directly advice. So he says, in general, please remember this. I shall repeat it time and time again. Do not write with your eye just on the present to win praise and honor from your contemporaries. Aim at eternity and prefer to write for posterity. Present your bill for your book to them so that it may be said of you, he was a free man, full of frankness with no adulation or civility anywhere, but everywhere truthfulness. That if a man were sensible, he would value above all present hopes, ephemeral as they are. <clears throat> So, sorry, I'll rephrase that because it kind of, my emphasis is kind of off. That, if a man were sensible, he would value above all present hopes. So, the future, the value to posterity in our future, uh, the ideal historian would value above all present hopes, present desires, the prizes, so on and so forth. Um, and this this shows the sacrifice a historian must make, if you will. It would be bigger for back then, not, not, so, much, not so much now because you don't really write like... The idea of writing a history to flatter a ruler isn't so much of a thing anymore, especially because like monarchs largely are not a thing anymore and appeasement of them 
of your rulers and that, except maybe, I don't know, in some third world uh, joint, some real authoritarian joint. Not really a thing anymore. History is kind of just done for history's sake these days. Although there are norms that are expected, and if you go against them, you can get in a lot of trouble. Um, so this principle for today, actually, I'll go, to, I'll go to present application later. I'm just speaking on Lucian's words here. Don't just look at the present. That's it. It's pretty, it's pretty easy that way. Because in that ancient world, of course, there would be personal historians and biographers for uh, major figures, including, for example, Alexander the Great. And he actually raises an example where Aristobulus, one of those personal, one of those personal writers for Alexander the Great, he was writing, um, he was writing on Alexander's conflict with the uh, one of the West Indian kings, Porus, if I'm not mistaken, that's his name. And he embellishes the fight like nuts. And so Alexander comes up to him, looks at it, reads it, and then just chucks the work into the river. This is what Lucian says. And and just he just totally trashed it because he hated, he hated, he didn't want to get appeased. And yet Aristobulus kind of just went along, kind of went along with that. He thought he could appease Alexander the Great in that way. So yeah, so just it's you're not writing it for the persons now, you're writing it for the future, which ties in, of course, to the fact of utility. You're writing it for the benefit of people in the future so that if they find themselves in a similar situation, they can learn from the from the past. Of course, I would expand this utility beyond just, well, mere utility for finding yourself in a mere situation, but also for understanding one's roots, one's origins, whether it be your, your people. So like, for example, myself, Lebanese slash colonial Australian, as well as, of course, the Christian people, so the church. So yes, good wisdom here. So to summarize, these are the the qualities of an ideal historian, according to Lucian. So burn these in your brain, everything we've read so far about Lucian, burn them into your brain if you really want to become a good, solid historian. Um, well, okay, we'll have some discussion after it where I agree, which is on almost everything versus where I disagree um, and all that stuff. But these are the qualities of an ideal historian, according to Lucian. Number one, a natural aptitude for political understanding. Number two, good education in technique, techne, i.e. the skill in his uh, skill in historiography must be learned. You don't simply have it. Number three, objectivity, which is arguably his most emphasized point. Number four, an eye for the benefit of future readers, not appeasing the present, such as flattering rulers. Number five, balanced, truthful, yet vivid presentation. And number six, an eye for the future. So if you... Well, I don't know if you want to write these down, take a screenshot, whatever, if you think it's useful. Um, I might consider uploading slides somewhere for people to use because that would be that would be kind of cool. But yes, discussion and questions. So please, people, give in your, give in your discussion points. If you want to raise any, any points, put in any questions as well you may have as well. Um, so yeah, on what I think about these principles, I think, I think they're like 90, 99% of what Lucian says here is spot on and should be emulated. He doesn't give every good thing that should be the case. I mean, and again, this is just focusing on what he says about the historian himself, not about the actual process of composing history. So that's a separate issue. But what he says on the ideal historian, in my opinion, is so darn spot on that I will be making this if I ever get like a history class in a uni or a college, I will be making that required reading for people. It's a really, really good work notwithstanding like things from the history that you may not get because because someone might not have read about the events of the past so he does make references people might not get but yeah it's 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 really is really is solid stuff solid advice solid everything really it's just a fantastic starting manual i remember i wanted to question something from one of the things yeah that's it so he said <clears throat> he said um that well so for one thing is that History for him, the prime purpose is utility or well, emulating Thucydides, quoting from Thucydides. He says that the prime use of history is utility for future persons. And in certain contexts, that's true. But as I said, there may be other uses for it as well. Utility isn't simply for just finding yourself in a similar situation and then learning from what people in the past did, although that is a real important thing in history. It can be for many other reasons. It could be finding one's, one's place in the world, for finding one's people, one's origins, for if you will finding out the purpose of the universe i mean that's literally what the christian faith is it is a historical faith it's based on historical events from thousands of years ago all the way up to well thousands of years ago but with another couple thousand years in between and so and so it's not really just 
it's we when we learn about the historical elements of the Christian faith and about the Christian church, when we want to learn about that, it's not because, oh, how did the church deal with these things? Although there is great wisdom in that. It's simply learning about our place. What is the nature of the church? How has the church reacted? How has God worked through history? That's really the prime point of Christian history, really, as distinct from a secular history, where you're you're trying to learn, you're trying to see what has God done in history? How is he working? How do we interpret this? <clears throat> And here comes number says, I'd say history is absolutely still written for certain audiences. Maybe we don't write a book for a monarch, but a patriarch's history, a patriot's history of USA or BIPOC history of USA are written for a certain audience, a particular audience. Yes, this is something I wanted to address as well. So today we don't have those monarchs, but we do have interest groups at, med, at bare minimum who many historians today, unfortunately, appease to so that they don't get their heads chopped off, such as, for example, when you say BIPOC history <laughs> Oh my gosh, of the USA, <clears throat> or at least just that's that's more like it's it's very deliberate, and maybe it's not our self interest because the appeasing of monarchs in that ancient time was more or less a thing of self interest. But <clears throat> for today, unfortunately, ideology is even more of a problem uh, than ever before when it comes to history, where people just impose their ideology not merely that they have an ideological perspective that that's unavoidable, but it's the fact that they then have these facts which render it which are kind of inconvenient for their ideology. But then they just either ignore those facts, totally twist it, and just superimpose their ideology on top of it anyway. And so, yeah, that can lead to many distortions of history. And I would mention, if it didn't mean getting nuked off YouTube, I, mean, I think it's very unlikely anyway, but I don't want to take any chances. A certain historical event in which you are not allowed to question the certain number of, shall we say, casualties. And if you do you're deemed any number of names. You're just an evil person for <clears throat> coming to certain conclusions based on um, whether adequate or inadequate historical research, but you're honest, you're sober. You're just saying, hmm, I'm looking at this and the numbers I'm hearing today, they're not quite right. And yet, if you voice that publicly, you'll get in a lot of trouble. And that to me is just, it, it boils my blood. It really does boil my blood. It's shocking. It's evil. This is not like the resurrection of Jesus, Okay. It's not like something upon which our society is founded, where if someone starts to try and refute that, then yeah, in an ideal in an ideal Christian society, I'm all for punishing that person. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm um, when someone's actively trying to question it, but I'm all for free academic exploration anyway, people exploring these questions. But as soon as they start promoting a denial of the resurrection directly, then, then there's another problem. But this is just about numbers. It's literally about numbers. There is no religious significance to this. Well, okay. Some people who question the, the the mainstream thing will point out the the significance of the digit, the beginning digit of the big number, which you'll probably you probably know what I'm talking about by now. But apart from that, for the victim group itself, it, it, it may be a traumatic event, but this doesn't shake the foundations of their existence. If the number is if different, it's it's just a okay different number, big flipping whoop. So the fact that you can't question it to me is just shocking, insulting, and offensive. Any Real historian, as we as we say, Lucian himself. Think about the event that I'm talking about. You'll probably I've made so much allusion to it. I've not directly mentioned it nor the number, but you almost certainly know what I'm talking about. Have that in mind and think about what Lucian says right here. That then is the sort of man the historian should be: fearless, incorruptible, free, a friend of free expression and the truth, intent as the comic poet says, on calling a fig a fig or a trow, a trow, giving nothing to hatred or to friendship, sparing no one, showing neither pity nor shame nor obsequiousness, an impartial judge, well disposed to all men up to the point of not giving one side more than its due. I have more to comment on that because I believe there is a, whoops, because I believe there is a place for um, for partiality, in, in, not in a I'll explain that later. Well disposed, uh, blah, 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 blah. Well disposed to all men up until not giving one side more than Jew. In his books, a stranger, a man without country, so on and so forth. Those first points in particular. On this topic, how many historians do you know when writing on this topic are fearless, incorruptible, free, a friend of free expression, the truth, and intent on calling a fig a fig and a trow a trow? How many historians on this hot button historical topic from the last century have that nature? Now, there's some who are obviously totally convinced of the normal narrative, and that's okay if they came to sober historical analysis or if they just had a biased lens, but it's otherwise an honest conclusion. Okay, cool. That's one thing. It's another if there's other historians who they look at the primary source, they, they see something, and yet because they know the consequences of just mentioning that thing that they see, 
they kind of gloss over it or explain it away in an illegitimate sense. How often does that happen? How often do you see that happen? And how often do you see people online, whether they're a trained historian or just some guy with a website or a blog who bring up legitimate points from primary sources only to get absolutely nuked? What, what gives? Why is this the case? This is the big problem. Historians today cannot afford, it, it, there's, there's an either or. Either you will be loved by the establishment, you'll have your comfortable university job, or you will be fearless, incorruptible, free, a friend of free expression and the truth and intend on calling a figure fig and a trow a trow. You must choose between them, either having a comfortable place in establishment history or having the true qualities of an ideal historian. That's really the core takeaway from all this. And really from this whole, whoops, spoilers, really from this whole series that I want to emphasize that these qualities, if you want to really embody these qualities as a historian, you have to make sacrifices. You have to make so many sacrifices, which is very unfortunate. That shouldn't be the case. Um, so moving from that, I might, I might actually clip this out and put it up in the future if uh, it could be risky though. <laughs> but either way, I wanted to point out the thing on partiality because I think Lucian's emphasis on being totally impartial is good but I'm not totally in on it because I believe there is a place it can be done where a historian can make clear their opinion on a situation. I believe this guy's in the right. I'm all for this dude. This guy's the champion. Even this, like this guy's the champion of the people and all that jazz. But as long as it's clear, that's simply his estimation and that doesn't cloud away the facts. So for example, he will honestly state the faults of his favorite leader or his favorite country whilst uh, giving even the good stuff from the enemy, the things they did well. Um, as long as he can do all that, he can still afford to be partial in that sense of giving his, of giving his take and even weaving his narrative in that sense to, to emphasize that, Hey, these are the good guys. Um, so long as he doesn't leave out any of the facts, simple as that, because it will allow people to read those same facts that he presents and say, oh, no, I'm going to come to this different conclusion because ultimately ideological slash religious slash epistemic frameworks are unavoidable. We all have that. And so you will come to a conclusion on a certain issue. What, what, what do you believe in the Ukraine-Russia war? Um, if you're actually into it, you will come to any number of conclusions. You'll say, Ukraine's totally justified in their self-defense. Russia, Putin is evil, totally evil. I support the Ukrainian people and the government resisting. Cool. Other side, which I adopt, is that Ukrainian government is not this is not this beautiful utopia that people say. The government's actually very widely unpopular in Ukraine. A lot of resistance. And given the encroachment of the West, and frankly, it is a junta government established by NATO. That is a fact. And Russia has seen the threat of NATO encroaching on their borders, which they have done over decades. And so Russia is simply preemptively defending their own borders. So I believe, I believe, notwithstanding any other um, faults and failures and dishonesty that the Russian government and Putin may have had, that frankly, it was justified. Very unpopular opinion, but that is my opinion. Nonetheless, if I was to write a history on the Russia-Ukraine war, that would not therefore give me an excuse to ignore the evils of the Russian government, the Russian military, and ignore the goods, if you will, of the Ukrainian government, um, but especially their people, because I like to put a big divide between the people and the government of Ukraine. They are totally different entities. People should not be conflating them. But yes, you can come to a side in history and within a historical work and even frame it in that respect and yet still remain objective. I believe that's that's totally legitimate, especially with respect to Christian history. The ultimate framing is that we are for Christ. Christ is the victor. The church is the good guy in the end, no matter how many faults, but we should still be very much willing to express those faults in, in a work of history if that's the intent. Because we have, for example, Eusebius of Caesarea. People fault him that, oh, he doesn't cover much of the bad stuff that the church and Christians did. For one, he does. He does actually give a few of such instance, uh, instances. But he actually explicitly says in his prologue that it's not his intention to talk about particularly bad episodes in the church's history. So he's actually, it's one thing to say that, hey, I'm going to write a history on this and then to ignore all the bad stuff or to ignore all the good stuff from a side. That would be bad. But Eusebius is actually honest. He's actually open in saying it's not my intent to be talking about the faults of the church. So you can't actually fault him on that. Maybe you could, at best, all you can do is disagree that, hey, he, it would be more useful if he included that. But no, you can't fault it in itself. He's he's honest about not including the, uh, as at least as many bad episodes from the church's history. So um, he's honest about that. You can't fault him about that. Otherwise, if you're trying to write a truly, a truly middle of the road history, looking at all stuff, good and bad, then yes, you must include it all. Um, but yes, anyway, I'll give it a couple of minutes if anyone has any other 
any other questions? Do I have my... Oh, don't, have, don't have my phone. Give me... Two seconds. Give me just two seconds. And... Ah, please, while I'm gone for like less than a minute, please put in any other questions you might have. Time to relax, time to properly relax. I'll give it one more minute for any questions. Well, I guess while I wait for another minute. So next episode or next lesson of this Ideal Historian series, I will be looking at, um, here, here comes nobody mentioned earlier, uh, Polybius. I will actually be mentioning the comments of Polybius because he has some pretty extensive comments on what a historian ought to do, what he ought to be. And again, emphasizing the distinction between the object of history, the actual written work itself versus the person, the historian. So I'll be focusing on his comments on the historian. And particularly, I think we'll also look at, uh, we'll, we will definitely be looking at uh, his, his really big, his really big uh, hatred, fr frankly, his hatred of Timaeus, uh, the historian he really, really rags against like in, in a big section of his work. So we'll be looking at what he says are the faults of Timaeus because they are really relevant. In particular, one of the biggest faults will be on the uh, principle, as I mentioned, uh, from Lucian of real experience that. Uh, that Timaeus is a bookworm. He reads a lot of stuff. He has a lot of knowledge. Polybius grants him that. He has a lot of data. He has a lot of sources, but he doesn't actually have real experiential knowledge. And that, that's the big, big fault and shows in his work. So Polybius will be mentioning him and uh, uh, we'll be discussing him rather. And eventually, at least towards the end, Gilbert Garrigan himself, <clears throat> keep plugging him. Fantastic book. Fantastic book. A Guide to Historical Method. He actually has a section as well on the qualities of a historian. We'll be looking at that as well in the future. Uh, probably probably towards the end, probably towards the last of these ideal historian lessons. Um, but yes, it looks like there aren't any other questions. Uh, aren't any other questions from the audience? I hope it was nice and clear. I hope this is very educated, uh, educational for you guys. Thank you all very much for coming along. For plugs, please do like, subscribe absolutely annihilate that subscribe button and drone strike that subscribe button and its entire family share this video to everyone you think may be edified by it who you may believe can learn some good stuff from it follow my other accounts especially well this would include facebook um twitter odyssey uh, odyssey is automatically backed up so that's good bit shoot but i don't really use i don't really use bit shoot at the moment but particularly above all gab because that is my main um, <clears throat> that is my main alternative that eventually should I get nuked from YouTube and Facebook, that will be like the hub of TO of my content, especially once I get Gab Pro, which will allow me to upload videos. And so that will become a center of videos as well because it is a true free speech platform. Other platforms like, um, what was it called? Parler and Getter, they're full of crap. They claim to be free speech platforms. They're not, they're full of absolute crap. G Gab is the real deal. You know it's the real deal because they allow the most unsavory characters to take the most unsavory takes, and yet they're free to say it. So, <clears throat> and of course, above all, because I really want to make this a ministry and a job uh, so that I can make this in with much more time, much more effort, much more high quality, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, donating directly to my paypal.me, and or buying merch, which are all, of course, in the link tree. I would highly, highly appreciate it. For patrons in particular, um, you can you can donate any amount. You can donate any amount at all that you want. But particularly for cert, uh, once you get into certain tiers, such as ten Australian dollars and above, and that's even less than US dollars, so pretty good bargain. You will get some pretty good, pretty nice bonuses, such as for example, early blog posts where you'll be able to look at it early and perhaps even give me some feedback and maybe even influence the final the final uh, publishing. You will also get uh, exclusive. You will also get access to research notes Discord channel where I post progress on my current studies and research, which will likewise help you out among a bunch of other benefits, including uh, priority patron questions for streams where I have Q and A's at the end, 
as well as for Q and A streams once they start happening, which I believe I'm going to start them this week. I, I do want to start Q and A uh, regular Q and A's this week. I don't know how regular I'll do them. They might just be spontaneous, but they will be happening. They will be cool. They'll be fun. And yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has blessed you. I hope you've learned a thing or two from it. If you have any feedback for me whatsoever. Oh yes. And of course the discord, the discord, join the discord. I forgot to put that here. The discord, the theocrat lounge link is in the description below separate from the link tree. Cause I really want to emphasize that in particular, join the community. If you have any feedback for me, um, feedback for improving my content, perhaps for perhaps even, and I highly appreciate in particular, um, suggestions for what to do for Patreon that you think would attract you or other people to become patrons. Cause I've been kind of disheartened. I've only been at two patrons for a long time, but don't make that as a pressure on yourself. And I only want you to become a patron if you're financially stable. And if you're tithing to your local church already, otherwise, if you're not, do not give me your money, but yes, feedback on anything and everything is highly welcome. And you'll be able to especially do that on the discord in the theocrat lounge. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely day and or evening. God bless.